I just got back from a doctor's appointment and I thought about trying to put on another shirt, but I don't have that many, so deal with it. Hey, hi, hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess. And welcome to this week's installment of Book Community, where I keep you abreast of the goings on in the bookish community. Where I... Nigel is down here on the floor. We got him a new toy because he had to go to the vet. Um, so we got two new toys, but this one doesn't squeak, but it like crackles. And I thought that would be better for him to play while I film, but I don't know. So we may have to pause and he may have to join me up here because can't have an annoying noise in the background. So let's just get it popping. Hey, Brewmate, if anyone from Brewmate is watching and wants to sponsor me, hit me up. My email is in my description box. Okay, so something that was sent to me last night, just really small, but it kind of ties into something I said last week. What's well, about ableism? So I looked up the definition for ableism and I just have Ableism is discrimination and social prejudice against people with disabilities and or people who are perceived to have disabilities. Ableism characterizes persons who are defined by their disabilities as inferior to the non-disabled. What brings up ableism again this week is this person on Twitter, Emma Novella is autistic. That is what their name says. It says, don't get me started on the ableism involved with the, oh my God, we bought a book in 2017 and haven't read it yet still buy books each month as if collecting isn't a symptom slash trait of any neurodiverse and mental health conditions. And then someone else replied like executive dysfunction shows up in my reading habits. There are some books in my mind just locked out and or some books my mind just locked out and I doubt I'll ever be able to read. I'm currently figuring out to sell. I wish I could keep up. And Emma Novella replied same the guru gossipers I don't know what that means. Also complained about booktube activists selling books when they unhaul instead of donating to prison libraries. Not to stereotype, but I don't see a lot of first degree murderers interested in why are gay romance. <laughs> Someone else replied, Emma, I don't know if you know this, but prisoners are actually only allowed to receive copies directly from where it's shipped to prevent interference. Do you know anyone in prison? If you were confined to a small cell on a daily basis, would you care what you read? very fair point. Someone else quote tweeted, I'm neurodiverse and love collecting things which used to include books. I'm not judging anyone for their collecting, but I will say that when I examined my book collecting habit closely, it brought me no joy and only served as consumerism, mindfulness over waste for me. So I say this relates to something from last week because I brought up a thread on Twitter that was by Jesse at Bowties and Books that was, um, talking, I guess people were coming at them or maybe, I don't know, making comments about a book haul they filmed. The thread was basically saying to stop assuming that creators, especially on booktube, just because they're monetized make a bunch of money and saying that people, you know, have some nerve to criticize large book hauls when essentially that's what viewers are asking for or expect of booktubers. And then they also said that it's ableist slash classist. And so I have just been confused if I didn't understand the meaning of ableism. I, and I'm just not understanding how, I guess having an opinion about how many books people buy and seeing that as somehow wasteful or, you know, bringing up the topic of consumerism, how that relates to ableism. So, I mean, if you have a good explanation as how that relates, definitely let me know. I'm just not putting the two together. It is just like this person said, like they obviously they were talking about themselves. They said they looked at how they were collecting books and it brought them no joy, served as consumerism, which we are book lovers here. Hello, hella books. I got hella books. I've had more and got rid of them. So I, I mean, it's just we can never have a open, nuanced conversation about consumerism. For some reason, people are just like, it's terrible or mind your business. And I'm like, there's a lot of, you know, in the middle, since we live in a capitalist society, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I was just confused on how buying a bunch of books equates to ableism. And then I guess judging people for buying a bunch of books equates to ableism. So putting it out there, if you want to explain it to me, 
please do. I'm not saying that this person is wrong or their thoughts. I can't comment on that. I am not autistic. Their handle says that they are, so I'm not discrediting anything that they're saying. I'm just confused. And, but I will say that I don't like the part they said, not to stereotype, but I don't see a lot of first degree murderers interested in YA or gay romance. Like there's a lot of people in jail and prison, um, a lot of innocent people, people for minor crimes, um, people for crimes that they did commit. But you know, it's just very, a, a very gross generalization of people who are in jail or prison. So I didn't like that part. But anyway, if you know anything or have anything to add to that conversation, definitely let me know. So I had planned to talk about Ernest Cline and his new book, Ready Player Two. So creative. The first one's called Ready Player One that came out recently. But all the tweets that I had bookmarked, I guess that he or someone on his team saw them and did something because now they all say media not displayed like they were screenshots from the book. And now most of them are, are blank. But the first tweet I saw was I know most people weren't probably weren't planning on it but please do not buy Ready Player Two because that author and his team are the worst people alive and treat everyone involved horrifically all the way down to booksellers who want to stock it even so they or so they do not deserve a dime and then I had bookmarked tweets of people who were reading it that had like taken pictures of the text but now it all says media not displayed this image has been removed in response to a report from the copyright holder really like you know how many things <laughs> are uh screenshotted or taken a picture of and shared on twitter i have never seen this before so they obviously did not like people coming for that book but if you have any pictures of the text that you want to send me so i could talk about it because i like to talk about things with the actual receipt or be able to read it myself before i can comment on it definitely let me know but i just wanted to bring that up because i'm sad I, try, I do bookmarks because it's easier to go and remove the bookmarks because I'm lazy because if I screenshot everything I'm not good about deleting screenshots so I usually don't do it until I'm actually editing the video and then I put in each tweet as I'm editing and then I delete them because I have a better chance of actually deleting them I know this is way off topic but anyway I should have taken screenshots because then I would have had the tea the receipts I'm sorry I have failed you but if you have them let me know so I could not find the original tweet or what started this conversation, but I know towards the end of last week, beginning of this week, I saw a lot of people and a lot of authors on Twitter talking about trauma in young adult fiction. So I'm just going to read some of the tweets because again, I don't know how this originated, but basically I'm assuming that someone was saying that young adult fiction shouldn't include too many serious topics, too many traumatic events. And then people were like, but why you know so here here's one it said kids out there been reading lord of the flies in middle school for forever and y'all are worried that YA content might lean toward too traumatic right now you know i feel like i was supposed to read lord of the flies and i didn't but who knows who knows another one was whenever people start asking if things are appropriate for a YA audience i wonder if they have ever talked to an actual teenager now that is factual because teens are strange and then I saw this one by Roseanne A. Brown. There is no topic too traumatic for YA because trauma does not care what age you are. Trauma is trauma, whether you experience it at 15 or 55. And teens need books. They recognize this just as much as they need books on lighter subjects. We can do two things at once, y'all, I promise. <laughs> Which is really true. I mean, I mean, you can learn about things that maybe you don't experience. You can relate to things that maybe you have experienced if you've gone through any kind of trauma. So I don't, again, I don't know who started that conversation, but yeah, you can't just... All of young adult fiction shouldn't just be woohoo rainbows and butterflies because life is not that way and as much as we use reading as an escape there are still some parts that need to be relatable to real life i just wanted to bring that up and see if anyone knew like where the conversation started the initial tweet because i just kept seeing people tweet about that but i agree that you can't that putting trauma in ya books is fine because trauma happens I mean, from zero to however long you live can happen at any, any time. Nigel, please stop licking my bookshelf. Do not knock over my Red Bull. We will fight, Nigel. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to hold you right there. All right, Nigel has joined us. So we're getting back on theme of how these last couple of book community videos have gone and talk about publishing because yet again, there's more. Okay, first up in publishing is kind of some good news, finally. 
So this is about Audible, which is um, obviously the audiobook service offered by Amazon. And the first article that I saw with Publishers Weekly was that the Authors Guild is working with a number of other writer organizations to gather signatures on a letter protesting a policy by Audible and its audiobook creation exchange that enables Audible Premium Plus customers to exchange audiobooks they have purchased within 365 days. Um, as part of the program, the letter says when a customer returns the audio, Audible deducts those returns and exchanges from authors' accounts. This policy is a clear breach of the duty of good faith and fair dealing implied in the author's agreement with Audible and ACX, which is Audiobook Creation Exchange, as it allows books to be purchased and listened to without paying the authors and narrators their royalties, the letter states. So it had more than 12,000 signatures and was being sent to Audible CEO Bob Kerrigan and Stas Zakarenko general counsel um and so i had heard of that before and i had talked about this in a previous video that you could essentially get one credit listen to an audiobook return it get another book listen to it return it and the cycle continues and audible had said that um they can and do limit the number of exchanges and refunds allowed by a member like if it's if it appears suspicious and that they're overusing that feature but that suspicious activity is extremely rare so I had seen that before by like independent authors or, um, you know, less popular authors that people would get their audiobook, return it, and then they would have sometimes end up owing Audible or Amazon money because people had returned their book and that money was being deducted from their account, which is so shady. But apparently this letter has finally worked because um, they stated as of January 1st, 2021, Audible will pay royalties for any title returned more than seven days following purchase, which is good. 365 days to return something is ridiculous. What are you, Costco? You are not, okay? Um, that just was negatively affecting a lot of people. And maybe it wouldn't hurt someone like Brandon Sanderson or George R.R. R. Martin, but for someone else, that could be really detrimental. So I'm glad that they're at least making that change within the seven days because that's more reasonable. Um, it's different if maybe you started it and you're like, oh, this isn't for me, although you should just listen to the sample. But if you've had that for six months, and especially if you listen to it, you, listen to it, you should not be able to return it. So I'm glad that they did that. Yes, we're glad. We're so happy. That was our happy piece of news. Now we gotta get back to the audacity. Fireside Fiction published an essay about Outcast by Dr. Regina Bradley. And it was an essay written by a black woman about black musicians and edited by a black man. And they hired a white man to record the audio for the essay. It's terrible. So in this thread, they say that was ridiculously careless and frankly racist. It's blackface, it's violent and it's insulting, I apologize. The author deserves better, the editor deserves better, our readers deserve better. My carelessness resulted in an act of racist aggression. I've taken down the audio and will have the essay re-recorded by a black woman as I should have done from the start. I've reached out to Dr. Bradley and to Maurice to apologize and to make sure that they can be part of the process of making this right if they want to be, but I can only imagine how angry they are. It's up to them to decide whether slash when to engage with me on this. Woof. Let me, I don't know who this person is. Their Twitter bio just says product designer and content strategist for hire. So like the first tweet said, this essay was written by a black woman, Dr. Dr. Regina Bradley about black musicians, outcast. It was edited by a black man and they got a white dude to record the audio. And I have a clip of that audio. It is horrendous. Fireside Magazine presents the Art of Speculating by Regina N. Bradley, edited by Maurice Broadus, narrated by Kevin Rainier, published in the autumn 2020 issue of Fireside Quarterly. I'm a Southern black woman who stands in the long shadow of the civil rights movement. Southern hip hop helped me navigate the contemporary black South. Oh, why? Why would you think that is a good idea? How? <laughs> I feel like every every video I'm asking how is this happening in 2020 and I'm just I'm not I'm not asking that anymore I'm just mm, mm, what also what was that like Jamaican in the beginning I hate it 
obviously they apologize they're gonna make it right but like you could have just done right in the first place what <laughs> what are you thinking uh, dr bradley tweeted what the hell is this um this is what you think i'd sound like what black women and southern black folks sound like I... she said ah, ah, fireside i feel erased with a white guy reading my piece being about being southern black woman listening to outcast i was available the piece literally starts with i'm a southern black woman who stands in the long shadow of the civil rights movement like why yeah why why just not ask her to narrate it that seems like the easiest answer the most logical Nigel, the whites are out of control. I don't know what else to say, but a hot damn mess. A mess. I know, boo. I know. We are, we are tired, okay? We are tired of the shenanigans of the white folks. They're out of control. So this next piece of news is an international concern for Brazilian book readers. And I saw this thread um, because Angie Thomas had retweeted and replied. So the a person doing the thread wrote to all book Twitter, Brazil needs a little help. So their largest publisher, it says Galera Record. I'm, pardon if I'm not saying that right. I do not speak Portuguese. Um, it's the, one of the biggest publishers in Brazil. And so, of course, they publish a lot of the big titles by authors like Sarah J. Mask, Cassandra Clare, Holly Black, V.E. Schwab, Colleen Hoover, Angie Thomas, uh, Rory Power, Kaylin Barron, Meg Cabot, obviously, Shelby Mahern, Mahern, by Sir, the author of Serpent and Dove. Okay, so the problem begins with the absurd price they put on books. It's so expensive, most people can't afford it. When they released Kingdom of Ash one year after the book was launched, it was cheaper to buy the original hardcover signed copy than the Portuguese one. Um, but then you say, okay, it's expensive, but you're paying for a high quality pro product, so it's worth it, right? No. They said the translations aren't always correct. Um, this example, they released the Brazilian version of House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J. Mass, and let's say they whitewashed all the non-white characters um they washed whitewashed them it was absurd all the fans were so angry and i said we made it to the trends and they said in the next edition they were going to fix it but if you had already bought it then like what do you do um so they have a picture of what the original text said in a cassandra claire book and then the portuguese version obviously i cannot read portuguese but i'm going to trust that this person is telling the truth so in the original it says the quote is, I'm not gay, I'm not straight, I'm not interested. But in the Portuguese version, they put, I'm not gay, I'm straight, I'm not interested. So they changed the character's sexuality. And then they have another book that's in Portuguese that said, this is an old book they never fixed. They changed characters' race, skin color, sexuality. Um, the books were poorly translated, wrong words. The character names are spelled wrong. Changes in or original text that were not necessary or make sense. Then the quality of the books isn't great. Um, like the paper they use, a lot of the books turn yellow within a few months. Um, they have a picture of like all the books in a series, the spines don't um, align, which, oh, and I mean like it's just a, it's a bad printing job, like the, the spines don't match. Um, and then other problems like books with missing chapters, mi missing pages, or the pages are glued together. Um, the spines of the books are not aligned, anything you can think. Um, and yet they're putting an absurd price no one can afford. I mean, some of the print you can barely see. And then I guess they tweeted, they said that there's a lack of professionalism. Um, I guess the publisher, the main editor was tweeting about going against pirating books, which of course isn't okay. And they said, I understand it's her job, but then she compared piracy with rape, racism, and murder and made a joke referring to in a case in Brazil. Yikes. Um, so they're saying we're basically hostage of this publisher because they buy all the big titles and it's either give them the money or you can't read the books that you love so much because everyone can't read English or afford to buy international coffee copies. So if we want our favorites, we need to buy it and it's usually from them. Um, so they said their biggest thing was to help bring attention. We're tired of the disrespect and we want authors to know who is selling their work 
and what's happening here. So please tag authors, publishers, managers, anyone you can think of. And then um, there are just more examples about things that they've changed in books um, and other people's pictures too about the qualities of books. And they also said, I figured out why Rafaela, the editor, was never punished. She's the heir. That's why she feels that she can do whatever she wants. So I don't know if it's heir to this publishing company, but then there's just more pictures of terrible quality of the books. Oh my goodness, I would cry. But Angie Thomas did see it. I think someone DM'd uh, Saba and I think she replied, Kaylin Barron. So it definitely is getting out there. Holly Black replied that she was going to talk to her team. Um, so I'm really glad that at least it is being shared enough that some authors are taking notice. I don't know what they can do if they have control over who gets the international rights to their books. Um, but that is awful. And I can't imagine, especially if English isn't your first language. It really made me think about our privilege of um, if you are, if English is your first language, if you live in the United States or the UK, and that's where I still buy my books from. I, I guess it's just something you don't take into account. You know, like we complain about different things with, oh, my book is ripped or I didn't get this special edition. And then there's people like here in Brazil where they just want an edition, a quality edition at an affordable price of a book. And they obviously, and they can't get that because they are being screwed over by this publisher. So just take a moment if you are like me, if you're living in a, a country where you're able to access books in your first language and they are affordable and um, they're quality, just um, be appreciative of that. I know I'm definitely gonna check myself, but that's awful. So we can only spread awareness. I will link this thread down below if you wanna read the full thing and look at all of the images or retweet it. And, excuse me, I hope these authors that are taking note can do something so that their books aren't being sold to this publisher. And hopefully there's another publisher in Brazil that can take over as the big one or at least give them some competition. I don't know, but at least more people know about it now. So I can only hope this there's a positive change sometimes in the future, sometime in the near future for uh, Brazilian readers. I feel like this video is so chaotic. This is just a small thing I wanted to throw in because I saw someone share this and it said Hachette Book Group will increase starting salaries to $45,000. So Hachette Book Group will join Penguin Random House in increasing starting salaries of $45,000 in its most expensive locations. Salaries in HBG locations with lower cost of living will start at $41,000. And these new uh, salaries will take effect in February, 2021. The tweet said, well, hey, how about some good industry news instead? We did it. I can't tell you how much fucking work and convincing it took to make this happen, but we didn't. And good enough, no. Is it what we asked for? Also no, but I started at $33,000 four and a half years ago and don't even make 45,000 now. So the difference this would have made and will make for new employees is far from negligible. Why are you licking your foot on my video? So I'm happy they got that increase, but money isn't real. And so we just need to pay everybody at least 80K. I'm saying like, all right, our final news. Penguin Random House is gonna buy Simon & Schuster for like $2 billion. Um, I did see somewhere that it has to be approved by some committee or something, but knowing America, it'll be approved. So when it is, there will no longer be five big publishing houses, we'll be down to four. Woo! The bigger publishers get, the less they're vulnerable to the influence of employees the more they can publish toxic material without consequence, and the more they can filter, funnel, and control our pop culture intake to make us better consumers. Monolithic, monolithic publishing is bad. So there's multiple threads on Twitter about this, obviously, and I am no publishing expert. So this is where I got the majority of my information. When there are large mergers in general, regardless of that, is in, I'm all jacked up, publishing or not, it makes it gives me heartburn because I feel like there's not a lot of competition as it is like what four big corporations own like everything so it just is very disheartening so this thread by Laura Zat says things that will happen when there's a PRHSS penguin random house Simon Schuster monopoly fewer imprints and fewer editors ever shrinking mid list, fewer debuts being published, fewer sophomore books, 
Agents and writers hold significantly less leverage, leading to worse terms for writers, lower starting salaries for publishing staff, no more keeping up with the Joneses. Employees will have less say over what gets published. Imprints will further chase trends instead of creating them. Any bookstores and libraries will be beholden to unfavorable purchase terms and a difficult distribution system. Small presses will generally have a harder time getting shelf space. Oh, and just to add to that, fewer people of color obtaining and maintaining positions in the industry as if it wasn't already a struggle. Fewer working class people entering the industry and fewer authors of color getting published. Published. Laura also said things that will stay the same. Big pubs will take no credit for the impact they have on culture. Publishers will not allocate any money for promotion slash marketing for most of their books and then blame literally everyone else and claim they have no idea how to make a hit. There will still be incredible editors who will fight tooth and nail to uh, still break out incredible books. I hope they won't burn out. Good books will still be published, but we have to push for them. Consumers, use your money wisely. Don't forget about small presses. So, oh, it's just so frustrating. Um, I would say, fingers crossed that they don't approve the merger or the purchase of Simon & Schuster, but I highly doubt it. This is America. They're like, yeah, we love monopolies. Um, someone tweeted, my favorite part of the potential Simon & Schuster sale is that Penguin Random House has been telling creators they can't afford to pay as much up front and split advances into a zillion payments that we all had to take a hit because pandemic. Meanwhile, 2.175 billion in cash from existing liquid funds. That's some, ain't that some bullshit? No more licking your feet, no, no. That is ridiculous. You can be like, okay, we can't pay you all of this up front. So like, let's split it into 15 payments. And, but we have 2 billion in cash real quick to go buy another publishing company. What? Oh, I would feel, I mean, I'm mad and I'm not even a freaking author, you know, waiting on your money. And then that's like when somebody owes you money and then you see them out here spending money, you're like, damn, you couldn't just give me my $20, but you out here buying AirPods and shit. I, oh, it's so bootleg. I, I hate it. Um, it just makes me really nervous. So the big five were Penguin Random House, Hachette, Simon & Schuster, HarperCollins, and Macmillan. So now obviously we're gonna be down to four. Um, and so this tweet thread says, within the five company oligarchy, one company stands out as a true monopolist, Penguin Random House, the mega firm created when Random House's owner, Bertelsmann, executed a merger to Monopoly by buying Penguin in 2013. Now Penguin is about to affect another monopolistic merger by acquiring Simon & Schuster from Viacom, which bought the company in 1994. The acquisition was always a bad fit. It was driven by a desire to create a vertical monopoly. <sighs> I mean, this part is long, so I won't read all of these, but the 2.175 billion acquisition is contingent on regulatory approval. It should not receive regulatory approval. And it said in a year which the FTC, the Senate, the House, Republicans, and Democrats have all taken up antitrust, there is no better test of whether they're serious about monopoly that, than this idiotic merger. I, seriously they said after all we don't have to speculate about what random house will do after it absorbs simon and schuster we have the historical record of what it did when it bought penguin shut down imprints fired workers subjected writers to worse deals and put the screws to booksellers <sighs> if you just had two billion waiting in the corner that you could just you know liquidate whatever assets to buy something couldn't you have put that into your imprint couldn't you have paid authors? Couldn't you have um, raised wages? Couldn't you have done so much more than saying you need to go buy another publishing in, um, company and take over that? That's just that's just my opinion. I hate it. Um, it makes me really nervous. And like I said, I feel like it's going to be approved because it's America. And then on that same tangent, I saw a tweet said, bro, why am I seeing indie authors being smug about the Simon & Schuster sale? Super uncalled for, don't be ugly. Um, Christmas tree, but no side pony today. But I've also got this ambient room on and I feel like you can see the light from the Christmas tree. Anyway, so I had that tweet conversation saved in my bookmarks. I went to screenshot it, got that first one, and then the other tweets weren't loading. And I'm like, that's weird, refresh, refresh, it wasn't loading. Exited out of Twitter, came back in, and it's deleted. 
So I think they deleted the tweet, but it was basically people saying that they saw indie authors being smug about the merger because it's not gonna affect them, they said, because they're mainly through Amazon, but someone said that it'll, it's gonna affect everyone. So now I don't have those reply tweets because it got deleted, like, it was up there when I was recording this video and then I immediately came down here to edit this video. So like within an, within an hour, they deleted it, which is weird because it wasn't tweeted today. Oh, well. So um, overall, if you have been watching all of these book tea videos, you know that publishing is a hot damn mess. And this just doesn't bode well for the future of publishing. Very nervous. Uh, Nigel is very nervous too, as you can see here. Oh, so overall, it's a one big fucking yikes to me. Um, just all these things about publishing. If they just now got to paying people $45,000 in an expensive location, good grief, who knows? At least they did increase the pay and at least Audible will be paying authors and um, voice actors for books if they're returned after seven days. So we'll take our positives and the rest we'll just shake our heads at because, you know, what do you do? The best I can do here is spread awareness so more people know um, about these things so you can, you know, make wise decisions when you think about what you're purchasing book wise or, you know, where you're putting your money. Um, things you can go retweet on Twitter to bring awareness to other people, but that's about as much as we can do is uh, use our pockets wisely and spread awareness. Hey, got my water bottle. Sit down. Whew. So I feel like that was a lot. I feel like this is very chaotic because Nigel and I'm just a mess, but I hope you enjoyed it. If I missed anything, left anything out, misinterpret it, always let me know. I love the discussions that we have on these videos. I learn a lot every week. And I hope that you do too. So thank you so much for watching. Please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you're interested to see more of this content. And I hate adding this, but you might want to hit the notification bell because I know some people haven't been seeing videos that they're subscribed to pop up in their subscription part on YouTube. So if you want to know whenever I post a video, which is always Tuesday and Saturday, you should put that notification, hit that notification bell so you'll know. Um, or just always check on Tuesday and Saturday. Also check out my description because I always have links to information if I talk about it in the video, if I talk about any books, my social media, all linked down there. But I hope you're taking care of yourself, wearing your mask, washing your mask, staying at home, staying at home, staying at home, get your flu shot, um, wash your hands, put on sunscreen, stay moisturized, put on some lip gloss, some lip, some, some chapstick, some lip chap, okay? I'm seeing too many crusty lips. Um, I mean, like on TV or social media, obviously, because people out in public have a mask on and it goes above your nose. Thanks for watching. See you in my next one. Bye. Tell the people hi. Say hello. High five. High five. Oh, thank you. Say bye bye. Say bye bye. Bye bye. I'm tired. All right, our last pieces of news, which I know everyone already knows about.